Hey there, scoundrels, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and you should all steal yourselves for the next pick in our RP class series. It's a safe bet that it's rogues. Let's get to it on WebDM. All, all of these scoundrels out here watching us, what ideas can they steal from us here? What are they doing with their rogues? All those right? mountbacks and, oh, and nefarious ne'er-do-wells and rakes. What can they do with their rogues? I, yeah. Quite honestly, an awful lot. Right. And rogue shares with fighter the distinction of being one of two of the most generic classes that are in 5th edition. We've got some great classes with a lot of like strong cultural flavors and themes. Barbarian is one, Monk's another, the Paladin is, is one. They're, they're, you know, they, they come with this kind of cultural, uh, some would call it baggage, others would call it opportunity. Yeah. Um, but Rogue is really one of those where it's like they're, they're, the theme and story of their class is like a, a specialist problem solver that yeah. uses skills to overcome uh, the, the obstacles that they face. And that's an awfully generic thing, <laughs> yeah. concept, right? And so for a rogue player, it, it really, um, it's really going to do them a lot of good to think a lot about how their rogue operates in the world, what the place of that rogue in their world is, how their past, how their, uh, their connections to other people, all of those things have made them a, a certain type of rogue that they are today. And when we look at the subclasses of rogue, we find that they run the gamut of all different kinds of niches that they can fill yeah. and and really is probably next to next to a class like the wizard or a moon druid one of the more versatile classes yeah, out or there bard. or bard those are versatile due to their special abilities and and their spells and like say the case of a wizard they're very versatile because of that i see like the rogue as being versatile conceptually they've got a lot of skills the, their abilities uh, usually mesh well with their skills and kind of form a nice synergy there they've got something for uh you know if you're combat minded and want to play a really uh, combat focused rogue there are a couple of options for that if you're looking for more of like an off-brand non-traditional type rogue there are options there a lot of the the flavor and the, the, the thematic strength of a rogue isn't going to come from their class abilities necessarily, but from how the player conceives of their rogue and, and how they portray them in play. Um, so it's worth, obviously, thinking a lot about that. Starting off with a thief, you know, I, in first season of Saber Dice, I wanted, like, I was like, I'm playing a rogue in fifth edition. Right. And, and, you know... <laughs> When you make a thief named Robin Steele, there's only one thing you're really good at. There's really only one thing. Uh, but what I wanted to do is tether him in a different way. Uh -huh. He's not just a guy that breaks in because he likes stealing shit or he just wants money or right. whatever, but he grew up on the streets and he wants to help others. Uh -huh. And he, you know, wanted to do kind of the Robin Hood in a city. Yes. And so, like, I, th I thought, you know, I did a pretty good job of tethering him in his world. Right. But not just being, you know... Oh, well, I just steal shit. Yeah, and, and I think, like, considering that, first off, there's all sorts of different types of, of thieves. And it's one of those things where you can delve pretty deep, and it's more than, it's like pickpockets and, and, and beggars that are also, you know, part of the criminal underworld. It's highwaymen and bandits, and there's all kinds of, like, criminal activity that your yeah. rogue could potentially get involved in. Thinking about if you are gonna go the criminal route, am I a criminal or am I not, then thinking about sort of where they fit in with all that uh, is gonna be a, a big part of your rogue's background and how you portray them. Uh, I, I think that it's it's worth pointing out that not every rogue needs to be a criminal and not every uh, criminal needs to be a rogue. That's obviously why there's a background and a class that separate the two. Mm -hmm. But the rogue has that kind of baggage from it. A thief, the thief subclass in particular, does imply a certain kind of criminality to it. But you could easily also be a, a treasure hunter or a type of a specialist artifact finder or yeah. the like using the thief archetype. That sort of fits within it as well and kind of gives you a different way of portraying sort of the same same class. Yeah, more Laura Croft. More Laura Croft or, or even Indiana, uh, Jones. Indiana Jones, things like that, just because it's like, oh yeah, I, I can uh, put those skills to good use elsewhere and not necessarily, you know, robbing people of their valuables and, and the like. Although that is very fun and some people, uh, you know, they don't need those valuables. So the rogue's there to ease them the burden of of having of to all that, of the all weight that, of all that wealth, the weight of all that wealth, <laughs> just like let me just help you out. Looks like your back's going out. <laughs> Go ahead and give me those, give me those chains. Creating a rogue character, it's going to be very important for you to have a strong theme 
for your character in mind when you're creating them in order to provide that concept or that theme to an otherwise very versatile blank slate of a mm -hmm. class like the rogue is. So whether you're talking like arcane trickster, are they, you know, more of a gray mouser type where they were on the path to studying wizardry and some event of some kind pushed them into roguery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they, they maintain a, a sort of connection to their uh, arcane past through the little bit of dabbling that they do. But for the most part, they are thoroughly over here as a swashbuckling rogue type who really only dabbles in the magic to, uh, to get what they want. Or is there perhaps a, a, a whole other organization out there that trains arcane tricksters as, as literal spell thieves? Like people that go in and, and, and steal magic, they know enough of, about it to get into trouble. You know, maybe the arcane trickster is that artifact finder that we're talking about and yeah, using yeah. The, the little bit of magic that they have to seek out magical items, detect them, help yeah. identify them, sell them on the market. Has the magic to get, get in and past a lot of the defenses that these places have. Thinking of a, like a wizard that trains kids yeah. to be arcane tricksters, to right. find things to bring <laughs> to him. But that's more, we'll get to that. That's a bit of factor. Uh -huh, sure, 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 yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do love that. But I mean, like, how different is that from, like, I mean, an assassin? Right. You, you go up and you talented Mr. Ripley people, figure out who they are, whatever, take them over, kill them, take their life, or somebody in their life of the mark that you're after. But, uh -huh. but that's that's a whole different thing than an arcane trickster or a thief. It really you know? is. It really like, is a whole different thing. And, and and like let's take like the other type of generic class, the fighter, for mm -hmm. a second. And like their subclasses are very thematic, very flavorful, and, and depending on which one you choose, it's gonna inform a lot about what kind of fighter you are. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the core identity of the fighter, all of the attacks, the the skill with weapons, uh, the ability to just, you know, whether it's second wind or action surge, and like use rep, those representing your training as a warrior, those are like core to the warrior and will be present in all of all different types of warriors. And while the rogue has a core set of skills that all rogues will have, really do feel like their subclass more strongly flavors that character than, than say the fighter with their subclasses. That's just my personal opinion. So I think like Assassin is one of those where it's very different than an arcane trickster. The skills that you're really good in and the skills that you might need are maybe different, maybe similar. But the Assassins over here, first off, they're one of the ones, one of the rogues that are, tend to be better in combat than others, certainly do a lot of damage if they get the drop on an opponent. But they're also good at infiltration and thinking about those things. How did your character learn that? Was there an organization or were they on their own? Is it, uh, an organization that provides continued assistance to them or once the rogues are out on their own, uh, they're sort of out on their own. Yeah. Um, you know, Assassin's Guild, Slayer's Brotherhoods, uh, things like that, that, um, you know, w when someone needs a, a, an assassination to be attempted, they've contacted the, they contact the professionals. Uh, which is where the Assassin's Guild might come in or something like that. Like, those sorts of questions, you know, provide the fodder for, you know, interesting, uh, interesting rogues. Yeah, uh, and then you get to the, the rogues that you don't really, or at least we, in the games I've played, haven't seen as much of, but like uh -huh. Mastermind. I love the idea of a mastermind rogue. The guy yeah. that's like on point and it's like, oh, no, no, you do that. And you give the idea. Yeah. I love the, he just kind of knows everything like an info broker or something like that. Yeah, you know? a shadowy info broker or a, a mysterious sort of figure behind the throne. And in some respects, you know, you could say, well, wouldn't a bard do better at this? Like, wouldn't like a College of Whispers or a College of Lore bard be better at the sort of power broker behind the scenes sort of thing than a rogue? because those characters have magic, and that might be true. Number one, the rogue still has magic at their disposal. There's a whole world of magical items out there that the rogue is able to use and make benefit of, and a lot of those will shore up some of those weaknesses. The other thing, though, is that the rogue is, magic is sometimes a crutch, yeah. and magic is sometimes a weakness, and there are plenty of ways to neutralize the effects of magic, whether it's overwhelming a, a caster with counter spells and dispel magics, or having some kind of anti-magic field. There are ways to, neutralize the impact of magic on something. And let's say you're trying to manipulate someone and you're making a lot of use of charm person and suggestion and things like that. There will be a re residual effects of that that others can detect. And if you're trying to stay hidden, you're trying to stay quiet and unassuming and unobserved, then you would probably fall back on more mundane skills that the use of them cannot be detected. Right. And the effect of them cannot easily be detected either. 
And let's not forget that the real world is full of plenty of non-magical examples of mastermind rogues that you could use. People who are adept at manipulating others. People who are adept at reading others. Yeah. And, and sort of gathering information from people perhaps without them knowing it mm -hmm. and without them realizing they're revealing that information and, and people who sit at the center of large webs of conspiracies and spies and things like that. Yeah. There's your mastermind. So Vladimir Putin is a mastermind. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I'd go so far as to call him a mastermind. but uh, <laughs> He's got his own country. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so let's move on to like, uh, like uh, Inquisitive. Like the inquisitive rogue, what, what does that look like to you? That's the lawman rogue to me. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. It could be a private investigator. It could be just a generic uh, problem solver of mm -hmm. some kind. We've got an inquisitive rogue and a paladin of the crown. And, you know, it's like Turner and Hooch. Or yeah. That's a really old movie reference. It reveals a lot to our audience where my mind goes for buddy cop movies. Well, I know, it's, it's I know. But Tom I, Hanks I, I, and a dog. I see more Turner and Hooch <laughs> as an inquisitive rogue. And, and that and, just moon druid that will moon not. Moon druid. Moon druid that will not come back into human form. <laughs> It's like, he's, he's talking to him the whole time. I really need like, you to come back. You witnessed that murder. I really need yeah. you to come back in here. Anyway. Yeah. God. Tango and Cash. Tango and Shit. Cash. Thank you. God. <laughs> I was sitting there the second you said that, I was like, no, no. It's freaking Sylvester Stallone. And and that other guy. I forget who, who Tango. Kurt Russell. Kurt, Kurt, Russell. Russell. Kurt Russell. Oh, yeah. God, Kurt Russell. Anyway, yeah. the Inquisitive is one of those rogues that I, I'm really kind of excited to try to to, to try out. I like their kind of uh, approach to fighting and, and how the way that it's described mm -hmm. in, in the subclass reminds me a lot of the uh, Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies where it's yeah. like, all right, I see how this guy's fighting. I know what I'm going to do. The Inquisitive is, is one of those rogues that seems to fight smarter, not harder. Yeah. And if that's the kind of concept you're going for, uh, you want someone who's, say, intelligent, clever, quick-witted, both them and the mastermind, if you don't want to fall back on magic and you don't want to be yet another highly intelligent wizard, then these are two archetypes that you can turn to that are kind of non-traditional rogues. Mm -hmm. You're probably not a criminal who's part of a thieves guild breaking into houses, but you are skilled yeah. and you are using your skills to overcome obstacles. And the Inquisitive works as, like I said, a, a private investigator type who just sort of takes it upon themselves to be a, a troubleshooter and a problem solver. Or maybe they are a special agent of the throne. The king has his stalwart knights and the queen has her queen's guard who are trained in all manner of combat, both arcane and, and physical. But they really need a guy who can just get in someplace without having to teleport, be invisible, or, or disguise themselves. They just know how to get in places. They know how to find the things they need to find. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to ask questions. They will deliver results. And right. they're not going to be traced back to you. That kind of thing. Right, right, right. right. Um, and, and, and also, you have Scout. Like, if you want to be kind of a little bit closer to, like, maybe like a ranger, but not quite. But not quite, maybe yeah. Maybe this is the way you could do your urban ranger a little bit. You could do something like that, yeah. I, I, uh, I like Scout because you get more expertise. <laughs> well, you get more expertise. It's you get, you nice. get some bonus expertise. But character concept-wise, the scout is obviously a good stand-in for a spellless ranger. Um, but there's a lot of other different um, different concepts that it can fill. Like saying it could be like a bounty hunter of some type or, or someone that uh, you know hunts other people down or that seeks them out. You might be dealing with like a, a herald of some kind. And this is someone who you know, travels far, far distances in order to, say, open new trade routes or to establish diplomatic ties with another, uh, you know, another country or another people or something like that. They are a skilled person who's at home in the wild and is not necessarily a warrior protecting civilization, right? That's what makes a ranger a ranger. So the, the scout rogue is just, they're at home in the wild. And maybe their place there isn't to defend civilization and defeat monsters. It's just to get through that wilderness as quickly as possible or as safely as possible. Maybe they work in conjunction with a ranger. A ranger-scout combo probably makes a very formidable team yeah. uh, out in the wilderness. The, at the same time, scout has a very strong flavor associated with it. And it's one of those where you want to uh, lean into mm -hmm. the archetype of being a skilled natural explorer 
uh, as opposed to a you know a, a warrior in the wilderness with uh, natural sort of, explorer with natural explorer kind right, of stuff. right. Yeah. polar opposite from like a thief that wants to be unseen <laughs> like the swashbuckler like you are literally like swinging from me. chandeliers right. and look at me and yeah. like taking people on one on one yeah that's a whole different kind of thing flashy um, you know ostentatious wanting to be seen wanting to be a distraction it's different than the typical rogue stuff right and I can kind of see perhaps a, a swashbuckler say forego expertise in stealth or even proficiency in stealth if there's other things that you want maybe you're wanting to focus on athletics and acrobatics and mm -hmm. you know you want that panache and flair that that comes from being a swashbuckling hero and you you focus more on say social skills and and the physical skills and you leave the lock picking and skulking into shadows for someone else you know? yeah and you're here to duel the bad guys and swing from a chandelier and just have a, a, a rollicking, good, swashbuckling, fun time. The swashbuckler is one of those archetypes that I, that I really want to try because it seems like it's a different, such a different kind of rogue. Mm -hmm. And that it probably plays a bit differently than, say, uh, like I said, a thief or an assassin or something like that. I, I probably see them as the most combat focused of all the rogues. Like, assassin has obvious uses in combat <laughs> yes i mean an auto crit is pretty nice it's pretty nice but the swashbuckler is one of those where all right i'm good on my own i'm good with a partner i'm in combat i'm here we're, we're fighting and we're we're having a an exciting adventurous time while doing it <laughs> yeah and you can be a little bit more lighthearted, perhaps yes. with your concepts there but you don't need to be necessarily the rapier wielding although you probably will use a rapier um, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Duelist with the slash sleeves and the arming doublet, and mm -hmm. you know, you could be a, a pirate or a sailor of some kind. Perhaps you're a performer, like a, an entertainer of some sort. You don't want to go College of Swords or College of Valor. You're just like, yeah, my guy's a circus performer who knows how to fight. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they're a knife juggler or a sword swallower or something like that in a mm -hmm. carnival. But those skills. You know, become something more when they go out on an adventure. It can be a way to make money. We haven't done a, a detailed breakdown with all of our class series, but I think it was worthwhile for the Rogue because there's just so much to cover and we barely scratched the surface for concepts. No, you're completely right. <laughs> uh, but let's get into the RP hooks from Xanathar's. Yeah. Because I, uh, I like these uh, three of them the, the guilty pleasure, the adversary, and the benefactor. Uh -huh. I mean, uh -huh. for a Rogue, someone who can get in and steal things, if you have a guilty pleasure, and you have the skill yeah. to, to exercise it, like yeah. that's gotta be just like, oh my God, right? Yeah, and so this is one of those things where I think the playing of Dungeons and Dragons as a game sometimes gets in the way of the narrative that you wanna have about the game. So yeah. an example of this would be hyper-rational characters either as, as player characters or as NPCs. Because we know we're playing a game, we're gonna avoid all the stupid mistakes that, that people make. We're not gonna get tempted by this, that, and the other thing. We have a goal in mind and we're gonna do it. Now, of course, players, there's plenty of things that tempt them and distract them, and yeah. et cetera, as, as players of the game. But I'm talking about like from a pure character motivation perspective, having a guilty pleasure, having something that's a hidden weakness, an irresistible temptation for your character means that the dungeon master now has something they can use to introduce a complication. Because otherwise your character is just gonna be like, yeah, I make my stealth roll, I'm gonna stack as much stealth as I can, I'm gonna try to hook myself up with a pass without trace, maybe get a little uh, advantage action on mm -hmm. my stealth. And I'm gonna roll up in there and you can easily hit stealth numbers in the low 30s that way. You're a ghost wherever you are. And it's easy to sort of portray yourself as just this profit driven, I'm gonna steal everything that I can uh, kind of thief. The guilty pleasure introduces something that the dungeon master can say like, well, I kind of want you to act not in your best self-interest right now. Yeah. I kind of want you to make a mistake. Yeah. That's not the result of a bad die roll. Right. You know? Yeah, it's, it's more of like you're in a tavern and your guilty pleasure is if you see unattended money, Possession is nine tenths of the law. Who cares right. that that was someone leaving a tip for the bartender? Yeah, right. No, this is where you wanted to be an arcane trickster. You just, you know, uh -huh. falls to the floor, rolls on over. <laughs> just rolling like, coins. I'm not doing anything over here. Don't mind me. Your guilty pleasure could be, uh, you know, a certain type of companionship or person. Maybe you just cannot resist 
uh, getting in an argument with someone mm -hmm. and you seek out other arguments and, and your character's constantly getting in drunken debates at a tavern, you know, potentially blowing their own cover, let alone whatever else it is that the rest of the players are doing. Maybe it's an object of some kind. They can't help but take jewels or they just have a thing for silver yeah. and they can't let it go, go by. Maybe it's, they've got a thing for redheads or something and no matter what it is, they just can't let a redhead pass them by. Just, Even you, though the barmaid is married to the bartender <laughs> they're still flirting with the redhead yes yeah. and uh, guess what uh, still gonna get defenestrated sure you're gonna get thrown out that window <laughs> uh, so it introduces complications yeah. and you can start to uh, blend these things together if the guilty pleasure of a rogue mm -hmm. is a certain type of person or just like I really can't resist a, a redhead then maybe you're super sly totally awesome uh, thief rogue. Well, maybe she runs into a devastatingly handsome red-headed adversary. Oh. Who she conflicted about. It's like, well, I, he is he opposes me in my goals, mm -hmm. um, but I just am drawn to this person. I get lost in those Magnet. eyes. I get lost in those eyes, Ethan, even as he's about to stab that dagger <laughs> right into my heart. Yeah. <laughs> Like, that's a complication that yeah. you, you've you now... I mean, that's a gold mine to hand to a dungeon master or something like that. Yeah. And so your adversary, are they a lawman? Are they uh, an agent of the authority of law? Are they a militia member? Are they a sheriff or a bailiff of some kind, a constable? Those are sort of medieval-esque law persons that you can use. Or are they like a, a wandering judge, a, a magistrate of some kind that... Just your your rogue just cannot seem to shake, and and maybe just it's not following even, in their wake. Yeah, and maybe it's not even like your rogue's like a hard bitten criminal or anything, but they are roguish, right? They're a little bit uh, outside the bounds of conventional society, and they're just uh, you know misunderstandings and misunderstanding, judge. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you, but here I am yet again in front of your traveling court. Yeah, you know. and, the, and the judge is like, Not nobody's you, ever but... seen anything, but they just know that uh -huh. they see you. You're always and there when trouble is there. Mm -hmm. That things are missing. Yep. And I've been to four towns. Yep. And those are the two things that are. Those in common. are the two things. <laughs> yes. Uh, is their adversary someone from their past? Yeah. Is it someone that they already know, or is their adversary someone that they don't know? And, and they have a, a, a hidden person in their lives who are throwing obstacles in their way or thwarting their plans without quite knowing it. And uncovering who that adversary is might reveal information about the character. Maybe someone from their past that they didn't realize mm -hmm. or someone from their future that they are destined to sort of interact with or, 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 or cross paths with. Right. Or, uh, as you blended the first two, let's blend the second two. What if your adversary is... Your future adversary is your current benefactor. Right, right, right. So this right? this could be one where you're dealing with like a, uh, a Walter White Gus situation where, yes, right now we'll give you the uh, lab equipment mm -hmm. and access that you need, but through paranoia, because we're all criminals here and crime breeds a certain kind of paranoia, yep. uh, we can't help but eventually cross paths with each other because you're an egomaniac. And, 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 you know, a danger to everyone around you, and yeah. I'm just a respectable criminal businessman trying to maintain my criminal enterprise. Yeah. And that's the kind of uh, conflict that you can interact with. You can say, yeah, my adversary is a future adversary. Right now, they're a benefactor. But at some point, perhaps they expect certain something that comes with their beneficence. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, yeah, we'll give you aid, we'll give you assistance, we'll give you a safe place, we'll give you access to a fence, we will give you the things that you need to ply your trade, particularly if your benefic benefactor is like a part of a criminal organization themselves. Mm -hmm. Our viewers should return or check out for the first time our, or our evil organizations show where we kind of go really into depth about like, thieves guilds and criminal organizations and stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a rogue that is a criminal that or is involved in crime, it's worthwhile to think about the, uh, the criminal organizations in your region. And yeah. if they are a benefactor to your rogue, uh, what strings come attached with that? Uh, are those strings onerous and burdensome that the rogue wishes to, uh, you know, to divest themselves of? 
or is it something that uh, they see the benefit of it now, but as the campaign progresses and goals shift, and of course the NPCs are dynamic, what they want out of the relationship is gonna change, mm -hmm. so that eventually it does become an adversarial relationship and those bonds of fellowship that they once shared are broken and all the more tragic because of some you know, misunderstanding or, or, or something like that. To return back to Robin Steele, like after, after the events of season one of Saber Dice, like he basically is now kind of the benefactor in two regards to the children of, of Briar Patch House. Right. Because, you know, his alter ego, Jariah <laughs> Vandermouse, uh, you know, provides the, 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 the financial support for the orphanage and everything, but then right. he notices certain kids who have a skill for the, the stealthy arts. Uh -huh. And that's when Robin Steele finds them. Right. Mask up, hood up. And yeah. he's like, I will teach you. You know, yeah. they don't know who that is. They don't know that it's the same person. No. But they have him in their lives all the time, watching right. and training. Right. And so, you know, it's another way to do it. It's another way to do it. And perhaps your benefactor was the person who trained you in the roguish arts. Yeah. Right? Maybe the assistance that they provided you wasn't uh, monetary or property or shelter from the law or something, but was just like, listen, kid, you need some skills to survive on these mean streets. Mm -hmm. Your urchin background rogue, someone trained them, perhaps. Now, perhaps they're naturally taught, and, and just like life on the streets taught them the, the, the skills that they needed to survive, hence the fact that you get skills with a background. But the, the benefactor can be there for to sort of provide a context for the rest of it. And maybe the, there's a, a mentor apprenticeship relationship with the rogue where an old man who, you know, appears as a beggar and the group of street urchins and other beggars and things that surround the beggar king uh, provide a, a sort of uh, information network and funnel money and you know location on stolen goods and all sorts of things that the thieves guild wants to maintain cordial relationships with so like once you start building up these relationships who does your benefactor know who is there anyone else that they are also a patron of those sorts of things start to build a web of npc relationships that when one thing happens to it and you can plug on a strand here as a dungeon master you can look at that web of relationships and see how those in, those actions will ripple outwards and affect the player characters. Mm -hmm. And once you start getting enough of those things going and NPCs start reacting to events in the setting and they start being proactive and the player characters pick up on these things, then all of a sudden the world feels much more richer, much more alive, much more uh, in motion mm -hmm. as opposed to static until the player characters talk to an NPC with a question mark over their head. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you or do you not steal from the from your own party? <laughs> you are. Do you or do you not? Yeah. That's a good question. I think there are circumstances where it is warranted. Yeah. And whether it is under the guise of a I'm just playing my character type mm -hmm. attitude, uh, which is not always bad. There's some groups and and people that trust each other that they understand that the the actions of the characters don't necessarily reflect behavior on the player's part. Um, it might be appropriate. I yeah. would caution against it as a default. Yeah. There are a lot of players, and there are a lot of players out there who play with groups of people they might not know very well, or maybe even complete strangers if they're playing at sort of a pickup group uh, in their game store or something, that you don't want to do things that could be perceived as sort of jerkish or antisocial or like going against the, what's good for the group yeah. kind of thing. It's not outside the realm of possibility. There are certainly circumstances where it allows, but having the kind of like rampant kleptomania as as exemplified by the kinder, for instance, yeah. where it's just like, oh, I found this in your pocket and you obviously you didn't want it or otherwise you wouldn't just have it unsecured in your pocket. Yeah. You know, if you really wanted it, you would have been holding it and using it all the time, yeah. which or is why I took it, it from backpack. you. Yeah, or you, yeah, something like that. Like that kind of rampant kleptomania is, um, I, I, I wouldn't put up with a lot of that, if any, yeah. from a player. But like, let's say that um, the party finds an object that they are, that, that multiple people in the group have an interest in, mm -hmm. and they have a selfish interest in, in for it. Maybe it's a magic item, maybe it's a, a, a special uh, object that grants certain powers or something like that. Depending on the group, I might let a rogue player say like, yeah, I'm going to attempt to steal this. If I think that everyone involved will be able to handle it well, mm -hmm. with the trust that if it 
if, if one player feels like, hey man, that really wasn't cool, like I thought this magic item was mine, I'd rather not have to worry about my fellow players stealing from me in the middle of the night, then that's something that, number one, you sort of handle both out of game, but if it seems like it, it could be interesting, or that your players are on board for it, or that they will handle it maturely in game, um, then I might let that play out and yeah. see what happens. I know that the the current season of Critical Role, there's been a lot of that as, yeah. as, as examples of this, right? Yeah, I was going to bring that up about Knot and Ford and the letter. This is all around like episodes 11 and 12-ish of the new season of Critical Role. There's a lot of stealing of letters and people keeping magic items that mm -hmm. they should be sharing with the party that's going on. Yeah. Um, it's an example of that. And obviously we're watching a group of players who have an understanding of kind of narrative techniques and what makes for an interesting story. And they're also all friends with each other. And yeah. so you're looking at a, an exceptional group of role players in that respect. Yeah. But there are many exceptional groups of role players most of them don't have TV cameras that they play in front of. Right, right. I don't want to give a blanket, you should never do X for that. It's just be careful. And yeah. have, the default is probably like, yeah, you really shouldn't steal from the party. Yeah, because um, if you do it too much, what it does is, and especially if you're good at it. If you're good at it, yeah. Because then at the table, you have players who are getting frustrated because their characters aren't seeing what you're doing. Yeah. But they have full knowledge of that happening right, and right, have right. no recourse but in real life to be pissed off. Yeah, and, and it will result in some very uh, upset players. If, some, if, and some passion, <laughs> let the passive aggression <laughs> ensue. Like I said, it's, it's, it's in the same vein of like extreme kleptomania. There are some rogue players, look at this guy over here, who love to steal things yeah. and they want to go on solo adventures to steal things and they yeah. like the idea of like being a character that sneaks in places and discovers things hidden while they're by themselves and keeping those treasures for themselves and like that appeals to the rogue player and yeah. on a brief tangent there is a conflict at heart within the rogue as a concept which is that this class along with the ranger really work best when they're alone right and they and that's a problem in a group game like Dungeons and Dragons you see the same experience uh, in, in a system like say Shadowrun mm -hmm. with a, a you know a, a decker who or a hacker yeah. who enters into the computer system and hacks away while the rest of the players just doodle on their character sheets or a rigger who plugs themselves into their vehicle mm -hmm. and has this whole big scene where they're driving their cybernetic vehicle while everybody else is just in the passenger seat right. and it's the same way with like a rogue a rogue that's sneaking out ahead of the party to scout yeah. and open and finding traps and opening doors and things like that is engaged in a solo activity in an otherwise grouped game. It coincides with like the bard in the social aspects of it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. They're the face, they're out there talking to people, getting information while the road, you know. It's more about everybody knowing the part that they're playing and right. being okay with that. Yeah, and being okay with that. And this is why I tend not to focus so much on individual moments within a role-playing game and instead mm -hmm. look at the campaign as a whole. Yeah. And at any given session and in any, any given moment to moment, scene to scene in a role playing game, there's going to be people who have a spotlight on them. There's going to be people that are, their skills are more relevant or their character abilities are more relevant. And you might have a player who finds themselves very often sitting it out, but there will be moments in which that player has a chance to shine. We hope, right? That's the end goal. Yeah. And some players need encouragement and some players don't pick the right class for the kind of character they wanna play, et cetera, et cetera. The, the player of the rogue needs to know that sometimes they are going to have the spotlight on them and that's appropriate. They should keep those moments uh, brief and, and meaningful and not you know dawdle a lot and things like that. And that's, a lot of that's in the dungeon master's hands to pace the game. There are other times where the rest of the players need to go, okay, this player needs to have their, their kind of fun. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to the group. Yeah. So it, it, it's a part of dungeon mastering in both uh, knowing yourself as a dungeon master and knowing the group you're playing for to understand where the spotlight needs to be, when it needs to shift, and how you should pace your game. Yeah. Because uh, uh, obviously everyone's a different shit. You know, it's worth it for the rogue player to know how they're going to handle these situations ahead of time, but it's also worth it for the dungeon master to kind of think about what this what will happen. You know, if a rogue's in the party. So one of them I'm thinking of is like running afoul of the law. Ah, yes. You know, a, a rogue player because be, just given the nature of the class and the nature of the type of play that it promotes the greater than likelihood chance of, of running afoul of the law. And yeah. thinking about the legal structures and the law enforcement in your campaign is, is a part of world building that's important. It defines your mm -hmm. uh, setting. 
I would point out that the two settings that I'm playing in right now and that are, that are my current iterations of the homebrew, neither one of them have the law in them. There's yeah. no guard, there's, there's no, no town watch, there's no judges. Both the great city of Oracala Palantine and Land Between Two Rivers. Land Between Two Rivers has the wardens who are solely concerned about whether or not those people over there are casting a bunch of arcane magic. That's it. And the, uh, the great city has private individuals who take it upon themselves to to watch over neighborhoods and things like that but there's no mm -hmm. police force and right. official judiciary yeah. and that's really one of those things that's a personal preference of mine i i find that having a, a strong legal system is a modernism that creeps into D, &D just because we live in the 21st century and we expect shit like a police force and judges and things like that. Having a dungeon master thinking through what the consequences are for various crimes as well as it communicating that to the rogue player so that the rogue player knows, like, if I get into trouble, here are the consequences. It's one of those things you want to work out. And perhaps as part of your rogue's backstory, you figure out what their relationship to crime is and, and how they're going to... Um, you know, how they're going to relate to it. But even then, you know, maybe they're they're not a criminal and they're just a carefree rogue who does what they want to do and is a loner and kind of a, a weird outcast and doesn't really fit in anywhere except mm -hmm. this weird adventuring party of other social misfits and outcasts. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, in, in someone like that, like, you know, if they never really fit anywhere, where, where would they have learned that? Where would they have learned their skills? I think that I like the mentor-apprenticeship relationship for rogues, maybe more so than ranger. I like it for ranger as well. There's something satisfying about the lone warrior in the wilderness taking on an apprentice. But the rogue could be one of those where it's like the grizzled old pickpocket who's nearing you know nearing the end of their their career but mm -hmm. you know sees promise in someone else and, and they need the skills that they need to survive or yes yeah, so they run they run the heart attack grift where they right where the old the old rogue <laughs> fakes a heart attack or becomes a help uh -huh. and while they're helping go through there all, those, pick all those little hands in pockets uh -huh. that's one way the ma the mentor and apprenticeship but what if it's like a small team not quite a big organization like a thieves guild with a mafia don at the head of it and lieutenants and capos but it's a small team it's more like ocean's 11-esque crime here oh, yeah. right you know it's just little quirky individuals that all happen to kind of know each other and they've all got their particular skills that they've got that they sometimes get together for heists and otherwise just sort of generally watch each other's back an association of free individuals mm -hmm. i can see as being a very roguish organization well hell john wick and the, the, yes the, just the, all the mythos behind that yeah the criminal underworld in the john wick movies is one of those that's like ripe for inspiration in mm -hmm. in, in uh, dungeons and dragons yeah, it's Part decentralized to a point but there, are, point. there are certain little little bastions yeah you know of yeah. neutral ground uh-huh uh -huh. and there's clearly like families and organizations within it but there's no like overall kingpin s yeah kind yeah. of figure we, we could talk forever about like all rogue campaigns and criminal campaigns and running a thieves guild and he said we have videos on on some of those but really the the takeaway for me with rogue play with with rogue characters and what their players should think about is you know where did they learn their skills how do they relate to the structures of authority that are around them do they work for them are they opposed to them what is their subclass and 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 its relationship to the rogue class abilities what how are how can they think about that in terms of their background where did they learn these skills what kind of environments did they grow up in uh, who were the people in their lives that were important to them and then building out from there uh, a, a nice uh, background for roguish adventures mm. Ba, 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 ba. What is your any funny or embarrassing moments in gaming that you can think of? Funny or embarrassing? Um, Pros that so... time Pruitt uh, didn't zip up his pants the whole time we were playing D and D, and I didn't say anything to him. Yeah, yeah, the, the whole, whole the entire time. Um, <laughs> Turns yeah. out he was doing it on purpose. Oh yeah, I was just wanted somebody to look at it. Um, <laughs> no, anyway. Uh, Funny, uh, I don't. I'll tell you what. We still talk about the hole in the ground with the tarp and the oh box. god, <laughs> okay. like that was just an amazing moment of just where the DM was describing something and all the players somehow collectively were imagining the exact opposite of what he was describing. Like I don't know that I've like we all conversed about it later. We're like, 
this is how y'all saw it, right? And they're like, yeah. And then Jim's like, no, it was like this. And it was just yeah. like, oh, I was reading flavor text, right? Like I, it wasn't like my own description. It was the boxed text. Yeah. Uh, with a tarp. With a tarp. And there was a hole and somewhere there was a box. Anyway, it was, I remember it being a, a, a very frustrating yes. <laughs> session because of that. Just like, because it wasn't something that you could just, that everybody just left alone. And it wasn't particularly important, if no, I recall. No, it wasn't at all. It was, just, it was a just a minor just... thing. It, you know, you're supposed to move on and just like, I, I, in my mind, it lasted fucking hours. We were just yeah. arguing. No, it's like this. No, God damn it. It's, you know, and yeah, I, I recall that one. Yeah. Um, there were early ones, like early Joshy games, not my brother Josh, but another Josh we played with, uh, where he would do like, this is the adventure where you need to go recover a wheel of cheese. And yeah. like some of those <laughs> games were fun. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Um, I, I would say a funny moment uh, recently in the Warhammer game, uh, we've talked about this in the podcast, but the whole like sex cult being busted up by the Empire. Sex like, cult like, being busted like, up. Where, where, where the captain just pulls a gun out and kills his own guardsman. And it was just like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and then just the aftermath of all that, dude, I laughed for so fucking long. Yeah, like, like, okay. And yeah, then like, just started turning my own guardsman into pink mist. It's just yeah, like, well, what are yeah. you going to do? Um, there you go. Hmm. I will say the the D and D story I've heard the most from Pruitt that he would describe as embarrassing was you jump or no, was it was no, no. when you jump down the volcano. Yeah, I was, I was just about to say, uh, Alara, which she's going to have a rebirth in Warhammer this starting this Wednesday uh, at 3 p.m. Central on Encounter Role Plays Twitch. Um, but yeah, she, I, just, I thought it was a, a, I thought it was a chimney shoot going down to like the forges, and I was going to be all like Brunor and like escape a fire giant by getting a little fire damage and then hopping out and getting free. But no, it was a lava shoot. It's a lava shoot. So you know, good times. I just, I still remember Jim going. So you're you're gonna jump in there, and I'm like, yeah, yeah no problem. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, I you know I'm sure that was yeah that was an instructive moment. Um, I don't I you know I've there've been games that I mine are all like holy shit that was a bad game like they're all like <laughs> after the fact like getting home like what in the fuck happened mm -hmm. that that game was so bad like either pacing or engagement with the players or just like you know those games where you're dming and just like no one gives a shit and you're like why the fuck am i even here those are games that are just like that it, you that for me resulted in a lot of soul searching and and ultimately like upping my game as a dm mm -hmm. um and, and you know trying something different but like they're they're not like pleasant memories they're just like geez this was a bad game yeah 